If the Persona series is known for one thing, it's their cast of colorful characters. The games directly incentivize you to spend time with these characters in a diligent manner and become their friends. Via the social link system, you're directly rewarded for seeing their stories unfold, becoming invested in the characters. And it works. Ever since they've implemented the social link system, the games have never been more popular. In past Persona games, you negotiated with demons who would puke out a card, and you take that card, Velvet Room, get yourself a Persona. But now, they replace the middleman with something a little more marketable. You know, it's just, it is what it is. The steps are still the same. You have to know who you're dealing with and tell them what they want to hear. And if they like you, great. If they don't, uh, you messed up. But for me, the game hasn't changed. It's always been the same. These characters are a means to an end. And I truly do mean that. During my initial playthrough of P3 in 2011, I just, I just saw them as stepping stones away to unlock these super cool characters. Because that's all I really came for. You can't blame me though. The first like the first two social links I ever did were Kenji, Tomochika, who I think you're designed to hate. And then the moon guy. So yeah, my, my first impressions of Persona were not the best. But I kept with it. And the payoff of getting that super cool fire giant Persona. Because I listened to Kenji's boring problems. It was... I was hooked. The fire giant, he he whooped. He just he just rips. Like he's the, he's the best. Like I was struggling in that game for so long. He showed up. I was like, thank God I talked again. Still don't like him though. But more to the point. Today we're gonna be talking about my favorite personas and why I love them so much. This is seriously the main appeal to the games for me. Just want to talk about my favorite personas designs. So let's get started. Going into a particular order. Thanatos from Persona Three, most likely the most iconic persona. And I'm basing this off zero evidence, just cause, just because I like him. He may also be the first persona I ever saw. I'm pretty sure. No, it's Orpheus. Yeah, that's right. Orpheus awakens, and it's like you know the main character puts the gun to his head. You've seen the cutscene. I don't, I don't gotta say it. Main character summons his persona. Looks identical to him. Kind of narcissistic in hindsight. And shortly after, this abomination erupts from the persona. What is this thing? Why is it so strong? He's got a katana. Oh my god, he killed that thing. Whoa! The red background, the T-Rex scream, the just... It's not a really well animated cutscene, but it's... Like, they, they've tried it two other times. This is still the best version. But there's just not a lot of animation. I guess that's all just testament to the storyboarder. The storyboarder knocked it out of the park. Because I still remember every scene. I haven't looked it up. It's just playing in my head right now. It's so... It's just that iconic of a memory for me. Thanatos being the personification of death. He's got these coffins on his back. Why does he have coffins on his back? Why do so many Gundams have stuff on their back? Probably for the same reason, because it looks cool. Why does he have a katana that's serrated at the very end? If you, if you stab whatever you're trying to kill, like you, there's already a sword in them. If you go like hilt to like, you know, the body, that's, that's just overkill. It's probably because it looks cool, but I do have one complaint. If you take away Thanatos' mask, he looks uncanny. And I've tried to visualize what he would look like without it. And it's not good. It's not a good look. Keep the mask on, bro. It's <laughs> He's good. I like him a lot. And yes, I also enjoy white bread. It's a little bit of a basic take. So let's do a weird one. You know, God of Death. Personification of Death. What about the Judge of Death? How do you say his name again? Radmanthus? Okay, we're just going to call him Rad. I used to hate this design. Like, really hate it. It made me slightly uncomfortable. That... This guy had a, he had a hog on his, his hog. The Harley Davidson motorcycle, the spark plug on his chin, whatever motor that is up there. It was weird. I think that's the point. It is, it is trying to be weird. And I used to be self-conscious about like weird games. How like, you know, you ever had a family member come in to your room and you're watching Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, what is this show about? And you're like, Because Yu-Gi-Oh! monsters were weird. Radamathus is weird. But why is he like that? The truth is, high fashion. Series illustrator Kazuma Kanako cribbed this particular uh, belt design from a George Michael music video, Too Funky. And when I discovered that, it just, just kind of opened my mind up to the possibilities of what a persona could be. Radamathus is depicted in this game to reflect his user. Ikichi. Ikichi spends a lot of time getting ready, putting on makeup. He's in a death metal band. 
Radamathus, on the other hand, was like a judge of like, you know, he's a demigod. But he's also a son, a son of Zeus. And Zeus is, if you know anything about mythology, you know Zeus is kind of a D-bag. He's probably not always there for his son. And Europa, you know, she's trying to do the best she can. But this is a demigod, he's, he's crazy. This is Radamathus' rebellious streak. <laughs> the leather gloves, the jumpsuit, the Harley. It's all there for a stereotypical teenager. I mean, does any did anybody know a teenager that actually had a motorcycle in high school? It's it's one of those things that's just a cliche. It does I don't think it really happens. It could be. I don't like who could afford that. I couldn't afford that. Maybe Zeus gave it to him. I don't know. Kichi doesn't have a motorcycle. That's Tatsuya. So like we're Maybe Kichi also likes him. I'm trying to think. I don't think he he ever brings it up. But see how I've just gone on this unnecessary tangent for this long? Just because, yeah, it, it, this design's weird. But it can kind of work if you think about it. A good persona design should make you think. Like, what? What is this dude doing? Do the rest of the Persona 2 personas do this for me? Not really. I, they just... They're all just kind of humanoid. I mean, one of them's a cat, but that's, you know, he's still just like a dude. I like diversity. That's a good thing the games got better at. If they stop being, hey, just a person in a suit. I mean, P5 gave us a bike. It's also a motorcycle. But the bike's not on the list. I don't... I don't like Joanna. I know they both have handlebars, but... You know. He thought I was going to segue into that. But that's a different vehicle entirely. Instead, I just, I just find Milady a lot more interesting. But I've talked about her ad nauseum on this channel. Instead, we'll talk about Astarte. Because I also find her pretty interesting. How do you get this persona. Think about it. From an artistic standpoint, you know, it, it is weird. There's a bunch of skulls are covered in flowers. And there's an almost naked lady on top, but the goddess in question has so few surviving statues, depictions of her. You gotta start from somewhere. I mean, in most depictions of her, you know, she's just butt naked. They couldn't put that. They, they kind of put that. That's a little more tasteful. You know, there's a lady on top of the skull mound. She's got her little you know, crescent moons, because that's a sturdy symbol. The crescent moons are cool for a couple of reasons. They're thrown around in a tasteful way. There's even even the rings, because she's associated with Venus. Venus doesn't have rings. I don't need to. I don't even need to look it up. But I will anyways. Okay, Venus doesn't have rings, but she's associated with Venus. They gave her rings. Why do they do that? Why does she have all these skulls? So you look it up. The compendium. The compendium entry is a joke. Like, what? The, it's like the shortest one. I don't even know why. And you're like, God. Dang, this lady was all over the She just did, she just did a little bit of everything. <laughs> you got the long eyelashes on the skulls, batting them, and it's just so, it's so cute. And then her long flowing hair on the model on top. Is Astarte, like where does, where's the actual persona? Is it, I know it's all the persona, but like which, who controls who, you know? I like to think it's the skulls. It's like a hive mind down there. Maybe in a different RPG franchise, Astarte would burrow underground, you know? It's so like, hey, hey handsome, come here. And the, co the skulls come from underground and get them, like a, like a Venus flytrap or something. That is a little off topic. Who do we got next? Um, unicorn. It's uh, a horse with a horn. And why did I why did I write this in the script? It's not it's not a bad persona. It's just a bit you know vanilla, vanilla, unicorn. Oh yeah! Atlas is sponsoring me to tell you about Unicorn Overlord, the upcoming tactics RPG releasing for all modern consoles, March 8th. From the creators of one of my favorite games of all time, 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, comes Vanillaware's brand new real-time strategy, RPG. Join the Crown Prince of Cornea, Elaine, as he raises an army to drive back the Zenorian Empire and reclaim his kingdom. In Unicorn Overlord, you scour a mesmerizingly illustrated world in search of over 60 unique allies to aid your cause. Each party member having strengths and weaknesses, as well as a class, you'll need to mix and match into squadrons to come out ahead in the game's intricately crafted battles. Enjoy a rich story where your alliances with your companions can be further deepened with the rapport system granting you stat bonuses and even special scenes as you chow down on medieval pizza. I know I'd charge into battle to fight for a prince who hosts occasional pizza parties. 
Vanillaware's signature artistic flair and game design principles coalesce into a game RPG fans cannot afford to overlook. Download the demo today and check it out for yourself as your save data transfers over into the full game. Thanks again to Atlas for the sponsor. And, uh, oh yeah, where were we? Haridi! Now I know what you're thinking, Johnny. No, 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 no. Personas and demons are different. You always do this. I don't care. We're gonna talk about it anyways. The story goes, though, she stole children away from, assumedly, humans and fed them to her babies. Then, one day, this monk comes along and hides one of her children. She's flipping out. Turns out he was on her rice bowl. I didn't... How big of a rice bowl are we talking? Also, if she has a rice bowl, why is she eating babies? I guess you can't just eat carbs. But the monk teaches her lesson. And it was like, hey, you're, just, you're being silly. You, you can't be eating babies. Come on. Just just eat, eat something else. And she does. But the stage of the design has always perplexed me a bit. If you look at her reader herself, she's still got the horns. So, you know, she's still an ogre. She's not going to lose the horns. But something about that smile... It's a little, it's a little sinister. Am I eating babies or am I not? Mm, I'll never tell. As she's carrying the baby in her arm, but you don't see the baby. Is the baby alive? Is the baby, you know, the opposite of that? Every time I see her, I, don't, I just, I get a little happy because it makes me think, oh yeah, her. That's so cool. But like, are you, you know, are you still evil? Like, well, you know. And fun fact, Atlas, before they work on any game, I don't know if it's everybody or just the Mega Ten team. They go to a shrine for Haridi, who's now a symbol of goodness and taking care of children and protecting them, to pray for the success of the game they're about to work on. In a sense, video games are like children. They have an alpha stage, a beta stage. Some are still in their beta stage. Not me. And eventually, they've grown too big for their nest, and it's time to put them out into the world and... Hopefully people like them. And you raised them right. Did the good things a parent should do. And hopefully people don't insult your child for clicks on the internet. Ooh. Let's talk about Robin Hood. When you think of Robin Hood, you think of green. You think of tights and, you know, some dude shooting arrows. And yeah, Robin Hood does have a bow. It doesn't go too avant-garde. But making him a superhero is genius. The color scheme is genius. The fact that he's, you know, so, like, bulky has a skinny waist, just emphasizes like Superman-like proportions. It's genius. He's got this obnoxious color scheme, which I think I'm the expert on. I mean, I'm wearing this in February. Think about that. And we got to talk about the face. Why is the face so good? He doesn't look human. No human could have that like angular of a face. I don't care how much mewing you do. You can't get a skull like that, buddy. When designing for a character that is so ingrained in our psyche to look a specific way, it can be difficult to stray away from that, but still be Robin Hood. And I think they knocked it out of the park. It's also just a pretty simple way to reflect its character user. Of course, Robin Hood looks like a hero, because that's me, that'll be my persona. And who could argue with Robin Hood's ethics? You can, it's so clear as day. Poverty. Sucks. He's helping them out. Robin Hood's user. He's doing the right thing. He's doing justice. It's perfect. But it's frustrating because you barely get to use him. I just... I want more Robin Hood. God dang it. Wish he stuck around longer. There is a persona you get for the whole game though in P5. More or less that I like. It's probably the one of the better ones. It's Carmen. It's from a French play. She, she lives in Spain. And she's a Romani woman. But she's a flower, so she's got she's got four. She's a lot of elements going on there. She's not just any flower though. She's a rose, and roses have thorns. So does the dress. It's wonderful. The traditional Spanish dress being you know, the petals of the rose, and she's got these. She's got these guys. Who are they? I guess they're the guys from the the opera. I haven't seen the opera down here in the Florida swamp. We don't we don't have too many opera houses. But she uses these dudes as tools. She literally just like, you know, steps on one, like a stool, for no other reason. She's not, she's not looking at anything or needs to get up on a higher shelf. She just does it because she can. She's, she's like a womanizer, but she is a woman. And I don't know the word for that. Manimizer doesn't sound right, but I'm not going to look it up. Manimizer sounds like a necromancer, but you summon the dudes and they're still alive. 
That would be a sick D&D class. Wizard of the Coast, you can have that one. These dudes, she uses as tools to further her agenda. It's a genius idea. It's also incredibly complicated. You look at this and it's just, there's just layers and layers and layers. It's probably one of the better designs, if I'm being honest. Tier 2 personas are like, they're never bad, but... I mean, it's Carmen, dude. She's even got the cigar. Why does she have the cigar? Oh yeah, fire. That's genius. That's not scripted. I, I genuinely just realized that. That's so smart. Don't know why she's a panther, though. It's a little weird. I know why her code name is Panther. Actually, I don't know that either. Is that why Morgana's in love with her? She's also like a cat? We're, like, we're discovering a lot today. And last but not least, let's just break it down. Arahabaki. He's probably the most iconic, you know, not persona persona, but demon persona. That's not confusing. There's ever been, because he just reflects physical. He's not the only enemy type to do this in most games. Someone has to reflect physicals just because, you know, you don't have that. Your enemies start to just sort of blend together. But he's memeable. And I'm not exactly sure why. It's just, it's just, it's just kind of ended up like that. I like him for a different reason, though. So every time I see him, I think back to my Nocturne playthrough. And I saw him, and I was like, dang, whoever animated this one must have had an easy day at work. But I like to imagine the animators on that game, they drew straws to see who would animate that specific persona. I guess they would draw chopsticks. I don't, it doesn't matter. But they knew, okay, there's only so many ways you can animate this thing. It is a statue by definition. That's kind of all you're getting out of it. Meanwhile, the other guy had to animate the final boss and they're like, ah, oh, dang it. Does the video game corporate world operate on a rules of rock, paper, scissors and drawing straws? I don't know, but I, like to imagine. In regards to the actual mythological depiction of Arahabaki, though, he's not even a he. Yeah, come on, lady, cover up. The Dogu statue design is so popular, it has wormed its way into almost every Japanese media I can think of. Even gosh darn Yu Gi Oh! I can't get away from this guy. Whether it be Digimon, Animal Crossing, Dogus just always show up. And it turns out the actual god Arahabaki. Probably didn't look anything like this Dogu. So when you really break it down, this is the least accurate to the mythology of the characters. However, we're just stuck with them. Because Kaz Kazum Kanko is like, Arahabaki, eh, probably look like a Dogu. And we've been like that ever since. Lesson learned, some personas from this franchise reflect their actual counterparts rather well. Not Arahabaki. But nobody really cares, because he's just that guy that reflects physical. It's not even a guy, though. But tell me, what is your favorite persona? Do you have any funny stories about someone you fuse or design that you just find ever so desirable? Lord knows I do.